Good morning. Hope you guys had a fantastic Thanksgiving. And I hope you had a good time if you went out shopping to get those door busters and all of that. My wife dragged me out shopping. So excited. Uh, but it wasn't for me, so not so much fun. Anyway, um, so this is the very first day of December. Thank you for being here, uh, just worshiping God. That's awesome. Well, as you know, we are in an in-depth study of Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount was given uh, early on in uh, Jesus' three-and-a-half-year ministry, and Jesus preached it atop what is known as the Mount of Beatitudes in the northern part of Israel overlooking the Sea of Galilee. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus informs us how a person comes to know God, he speaks to us about traits that one must take on uh, if he or she desires to become a follower of his. And Jesus lays out what his ex expectations are uh, for all who become a disciple of his. And in his famous sermon, Jesus also teaches us how to get on the path to true and lasting happiness. And he tells those who accept him what our role in the world is is now that we're a follower of his. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does some corrective teaching because the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, had been misrepresenting God to the people of God and they had taught uh, them incorrectly in regards to the original meaning and original intent of God's moral and ethical laws. And this is the part of Jesus' sermon that we've been unpacking for the last Four weeks. So today, Jesus is going to do a little more corrective teaching, but mainly he seems to be laying out some more of the expectations that he has for those who have chosen to be a disciple of his. And so this brings us to a very interesting passage this morning, and it's Matthew 5, 38 through 42. And in this passage, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Eye for eye and tooth for what? Tooth. tooth. But I tell you, do not resist what? An evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Finish it with me, good and strong, go. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Whoa. Okay, so, as you might guess, and I'm going to say it right up front, uh, I need to tell you that this is one of the most debated passages in the Bible in regards to what Jesus is ultimately getting at here. Theologians and scholars have disagreed on the proper way to interpret this text. Some say Jesus means for all of this to be taken very literally. Others say Jesus may be using the rhetorical device known as hyperbole, i.e. the intentional use of exaggeration to grab uh, our attention or to shock us out of our complacency, like he did earlier in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, if your right hand causes you to stumble, do what? Cut it, Cut it off. Okay, so just to be clear, in case you weren't here for that study, Jesus doesn't literally mean for you to cut off your hand. Don't do that. In regards to today's passage, some would say that it is really more a spiritual teaching than a physical or material teaching. Others see Jesus' sayings here as having to do with principles, certain principles, and an inward attitude that followers are to work at walking through all of life with. And some say that the ultimate lesson here is that a follower of Jesus is to die to self. So with the wide diversity of opinion by great thinkers, we must maintain a humble heart and not be insistent that our understanding is the for sure absolute correct one. By God's grace, 
I am a professionally trained theologian, and I have spent many hours at different points over the decades seeking to discern the meaning of this particular portion of Jesus' most famous sermon. I believe I have an educated perspective to give, but I will not insist that people accept it as the for sure, 100%, absolutely correct at all points interpretation. I will not insist. I think anyone who would do that would be unwise and a little bit arrogant. This is a tough passage to understand, and we should just all admit it. So let's all say, we admit it. All together, go. We admit it. All right, good. And you know what? I think Jesus meant for us to struggle with this part of his message. I think he wanted us to have to ponder long and hard about what he's really saying and seeking to work out in our individual lives here. And because of that, because I think he wanted us to ponder, I think the meaning of his words in this passage go far deeper than what one might think at first glance. With that, I will now, with fear and trembling, proceed to share my humble perspective on this text. Now, this may be a little disjointed and not as smooth or as easy to follow as most of my messages hopefully are, uh, but I do want to invite you to give good mental attention and to inwardly pray that the Holy Spirit gives you divine insight and that there will be takeaways that God has for your life that will be truly helpful to your spiritual walk and development as a follower of Jesus. Okay, with that, let's try to unpack this morning's text. This, Jesus, for the fifth time in the Sermon on the Mount, starts with the words, you have heard that it was said. And what the crowd had heard and what the scribes and Pharisees had said and taught them was the legislation that Moses had given God's people that states that an eye for an eye, finish it, and a tooth for a tooth. And this legislation can be found in Exodus 21, 24, and in a couple of other Old Testament passages. Why was this law established by God through Moses in the first place? It was for the purpose of controlling anger and violence and the desire for revenge. You see, our sinful human propensity is not just the desire to strike back when we've been struck or when an offense has been committed against us. Our, our propensity is to strike back excessively, right? We've all seen this, I think, on the evening news. We see this kind of thing all the time, at least I do. Someone commits even just a verbal offense against another, and that other person goes completely off, beating the offender to the ground, and then even after the offender is unconscious, the one who's been offended stomps the person's head into the pavement. Have you seen this? It's happening all the time. It's, it's very, to me, it's like very disturbing. It's, it's very vicious what humans will do in response to a real or a perceived insult or offense. Well, folks, this kind of thing was happening back in the time of Moses. At the slightest injury, the person injured responded with vengeance, physically injuring or even killing the offender. The propensity in our human sinful nature toward anger, toward retribution and retaliation. This is a real thing, and it has always been, ever since the fall of humankind in the Garden of Eden. Remember Cain and Abel? Murder, early on. So again, the purpose of the Mosaic legislation was to control and reduce this out-of-control behavior among God's Old Testament people, and it was for the purpose of ushering in a certain amount of order. Now, of course, God's ultimate objective is to save and deliver at least those who come to him through Jesus from all these kinds of evil things when we go to be with him after this life. 
But in the meantime, God has, has had to uh, put a check on sin with laws uh, that put boundaries and that call for equity in such matters as personal injury, i.e. the punishment must fit the crime and not be in excess of it. So the principle that was used to illustrate this, if another knocks out a tooth, you may knock out one of their teeth, but that's all. And you get it that it's a principle, right? I mean, because imagine trying to line someone, okay, I'm going to punch you in the face. I'm just going to knock out one tooth, you know, but then they take two and then it's their turn and on you go, right? So this is a principle, right? This is a principle. You can knock out one of their teeth, but that's all. Just and fair recompense is the point of that Old Testament legislation. There was to be a correspondence between the crime and the punishment. So understand, God, God was not urging people to gouge out the other person's eye if they somehow knocked out your eye. Um, God was not commanding them to do that. What God was doing was limiting how far one could go in response to an offense. And this originally, this, this law was to be done through the judicial system that had been established at that time. Folks, this was not a legislation that gave the green light for so-called street justice. You know, you had to take your case to an appointed judge who was to decide the case in an equitable way. The scribes and Pharisees, however, ignored all of this and basically taught that it was one's right and duty to personally exact an eye or a tooth. It was something to be, according to them, insisted upon rather than viewing this law positively as an encouragement to exhibit restraint when dealing with offenses. But Jesus then takes this law with its positive original intent and he segues into a teaching specifically meant for those who would choose to become his followers. He says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, and what does Jesus tell us? He tells us, do not resist an evil person. The KJV, King James Version, simply translates this as, read it with me, resist not evil. <laughs> right? Like, what? Now, tragically, people over the centuries have stopped at that phrase, resist not evil. And they did not continue reading onto the example that Jesus gives in the very same verse as to what he means by Resist not evil. And because people just stopped at this verse, impossible and ridiculous interpretations have come forth over the years. There have been some Christian leaders in, in recent history who, based on the phrase, resist not evil, they have argued, based on that, that we are to take this phrase in the most literal of ways and to do away with the police, our military, our judicial system, our jails, and so on. Resist not evil, they say. Well, that kind of interpretation is for sure erroneous because not only does it reach the level of ridiculousness, but there are also other passages in the Bible that clearly contradict that kind of notion, and Scripture does not contradict itself. That's just a basic rule of interpretation. Violent criminals, radical Islamists, and foreign powers that would like to conquer us, they would love for us to take the phrase, resist not evil, literally. They would love that so that they could dance right in and do with us as they will. So no, the phrase, resist not evil, 
does not mean that violent criminals, terrorists, and nations that are hostile toward us, the phrase does not mean that we are not to resist, fight against, and push evil, or punish evildoers as a community, a city, a county, a state, and country. So we must read on and let Jesus finish his statement. Jesus says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Here comes the example. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now Jesus starts his statement with the words, but I tell you, I tell you. Who is the you that Jesus ultimately has in mind here? Everyone on the Mount of Beatitudes or every human in the world in general? No. As we indicated a moment ago, the person or persons Jesus specifically has in mind here are those who become a follower of his. Remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying out his expectations for all who choose to accept him as the Savior and Master of their life. It is the Christian person that he has in mind and only the Christian person. For no one but the Christian person who has the Holy Spirit dwelling within him or her is going to be able to overcome the sinful human tendencies that we have to be able to obey what Jesus is getting at in this passage that we are studying today. It is to the Christian person, the person who has chosen to follow Jesus, that Jesus says, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now let's make sure we understand the specific kind of situation that Jesus has in mind here. Jesus does not have in mind you being randomly attacked on the street by someone who's high or something and you not defending yourself. No, in that situation, you need to defend yourself. So here's the thing. You see, the vast majority of people are right-handed. So if a right-handed person were to come up and strike you, they would be hitting you on the left side of your face, not on your right cheek. And Jesus says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, do not resist the evil person or strike back. Here's the deal. If someone were to hit you on the right cheek in Jesus' day, they would be backhanding you, which is what one would do to insult a person. So what Jesus is addressing here is a situation where someone is intentionally insulting you, whether it be by backhanding you or whether it's through the use of verbal insults. Here's something else we need to know as we seek to interpret Jesus' teaching here. The word in the original text of the New Testament that's being translated into English as evil person in the NIV translation can also be rightly translated into English as evil intentioned person. So with the things just explained, if we were to paraphrase Matthew 5, 39, it might go something like this. Remember the context. If an evil-intentioned person intentionally insults you for being a follower of mine, do not strike back. I believe what Jesus may ultimately have in view in the passage that we're studying today is the persecution that he knew his followers were going to be facing in the world back then and throughout history once he returned to heaven. And he wanted to help you and I prepare for that by our learning to die to self in regards to our natural, sinful inclinations to retaliate when we are offended. You will recall that in Jesus' first nine statements of his message, 
which are known as the Beatitudes, Jesus' ninth statement, his last statement was, blessed are those who are what? Persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people what? Insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It is very interesting to note that in the Beatitudes, Jesus spends more time expounding on the ninth statement than on the other eight. And it is also interesting to note that next week in the paragraph after the one that we're studying today, Jesus is going to be addressing persecution again. So you see the bookends around what we're talking about today. So there are multiple reasons why I think today's text is ultimately about dying to self in preparation for what Jesus knew was and is to come for we who have chosen to become a follower of his. To restrain ourselves from retaliating requires our dying to ego, to self. And this is what Jesus did and this is what Jesus modeled. In speaking of Jesus as our example, the apostle Peter says to believers in 1 Peter 2.23, he says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not, what? Retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus wants, I think, to prepare you and me for what has come to so many Christians around the world throughout the centuries. And the first thing he wants us to practice and learn is the restraining of ourselves from retaliating when insulted. In any situation in life, practice not retaliating. Practice now. The second thing he wants us to learn is gleaned from Jesus' next two statements in this morning's passage, which are, and if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your what? Cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Ultimately, what Jesus is instructing his followers to practice and to learn here is the dying to self by not always demanding our rights, which we're always doing in our culture. And here's how we arrive at that understanding from the statements that Jesus just made. According to the Jewish law, a man could never be sued for his outer garment, his cloak or coat, never. But it was legitimate to sue a man for his inner garment or tunic, which was like a long shirt with a collar. In other words, it was your right to keep your coat. They can't sue you for your coat. This picture from the movie The Passion shows Jesus washing his disciples' feet at the Last Supper, wearing the inner kind of garment and outer garment just mentioned. Anyway, for Jesus to say, also give your coat to the person who's suing you for your tunic. For him to say that is for him to say, give up your right, even though it would be perfectly legal for you to demand your right to keep your cloak. Give up your right. In Jesus' second statement about going two miles when forced to go one, I think the same basic point is being made. You see, in the first century, the Jews were a conquered people. Roman soldiers occupied their country and they had the right to force you to carry supplies, equipment, baggage, or whatever 
from one place to another for them for up to a mile. Even Roman law had limits because you don't want to incite the people you've conquered to uprise against you, right? So they could do it for a mile. And then after you carried their stuff for a mile, then they would force another person to carry it for the next leg of the journey if they had further to go. But it would be a violation of your rights if they forced you to go beyond that first mile. This right of Roman soldiers to press you into service can be seen when Simon of Cyrene was just plucked out of the crowd and forced to help Jesus carry his cross when Jesus was no longer able to do it on his own. Anyway, for Jesus to instruct his followers to give up their coat to the one suing for their tunic and to go a second mile for their country's oppressors is for him to say, practice giving up your rights. Practice it now. And for a person to do that, it's going to require that they overcome pridefulness, deny their sinful human inclinations toward always demanding their rights and always wanting to retaliate against one's enemies. In short, it requires that we die to self. Okay, so as indicated earlier, I believe what Jesus is ultimately doing in this part of the Sermon on the Mount uh, that we're studying today, I think he's preparing those who choose to follow him to be ready for persecution. Persecution that they're going to face after his ascension back to God the Father in heaven. And one of the ways to die to self in preparation for that time is to practice not demanding our rights now in everyday life. Because when persecution comes, Jesus knows that in addition to insults being hurled at us for being a follower of his, another thing we're going to experience is having our legal rights stripped away, and we have to be ready for that. You see, Jesus was a citizen of Israel, and his rights were stripped from him and trampled on. Think of it. The Pharisees, the scribes, high priests, they had decided already that they wanted to have Jesus killed well before they had a charge to arrest him on. The Jew Jewish Supreme Court that would be trying Jesus was called the Sanhedrin. And those who wanted Jesus dead were part of that court. And we know historically that the Sanhedrin had strict guidelines on how they were to function. But in the case of Jesus, those guidelines just got pushed away and were not followed. The payment of blood money to Judas. And the whole process of Jesus' arrest and trial, folks, was illegal and a miscarriage of justice. From a legal standpoint, Jesus' rights were completely stripped from him, and yet Jesus is not seen in Scripture making any demands that he receive his rights. Because he knew, just like we'll know when we're persecuted, he knew he would not receive his rights from those in power who had it out for him. Jesus had prepared himself for this day and was ready for it within his soul. In all of this, Jesus modeled what he had taught in the Sermon on the Mount three and a half years earlier to all who had become a follower of his. Well, in the much debated passage that we're studying this morning, Jesus gives one more instruction that also has to do, in my view, with the preparing of his followers for the persecution that was to and has come to millions of Christians throughout the centuries right up to this present time. In Matthew 5.42, Jesus says, Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants you to borrow from you. Dying to self in the area of money 
and possessions is what I believe Jesus is ultimately getting at here. You see, in interpreting the meaning of this verse, we need to remind ourselves of something we said earlier so as to keep us from reaching a level of ridiculousness or an interpretation that would be clearly contradicted by another passage of Scripture. So here's where I'm going with this. Imagine people out there learning that Christians are literally to give to anyone who asks of us and to not turn away anyone that wants to borrow from us. Imagine such a world, right? Listen, there were professional beggars in Jesus' day, even as there are in our day, especially if you've been to Europe, you've seen gypsies. This is what they do. They're professional beggars. They get down, they, you know, and they want you to give them stuff, and they don't work, and they don't want to work. And they wouldn't if they could, right? They're professional beggars. So there were professional beggars in Jesus' day, just like there's professional beggars in our day, who would love, they would love to find out that Christians are to take this verse in the most absolute and literal way possible because then they know we can't say no to their request. Here's something else we need to understand. The scripture has much to say about not being lazy and about having a strong work ethic. And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, in a very straightforward way, he says that if a person is able to work and could work but won't work, that we're not to give that person anything. So there's a passage of Scripture that clearly contradicts the kind of interpretation that some people come up with on give to those who ask and so on. So then what is Jesus getting at here? Well, I think he wants us to practice not holding so tightly to our money and stuff and for at least a couple of reasons. A, when people hold tightly to their money and stuff, it reveals that their trust is in themselves and in their money and stuff rather than in God to take care of them. And it also reveals that they don't recognize that all that they have actually belongs to God. For as the scripture says, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it is also the Lord. So nothing we have is really ours anyway. And B, and to the point of this passage, many Christians throughout the centuries have had their money and possessions taken from them by those persecuting them, and we have to be prepared for that. And we have multiple references to this kind of thing taking place in the early church, not long after Jesus ascended back to heaven. In chapter 2 of the book of James, James says to those he's writing to, he says they're suffering. He's trying to encourage them to hang in. Is, not, is it not the rich who are what? Exploiting you, using the legal system to take advantage of you, to get your stuff and so on. You hated Christians. Are they not the ones who are what? Dragging you in to court. James goes on to encourage his readers to be patient and to persevere through the persecution and suffering that they're going through, and he tells them not to retaliate or seek revenge, for at the proper time God himself will avenge them. In Hebrews 10, the writer of Hebrews says to the believers that he's writing to, and he's, they're, they've been in the faith for a while, they're growing tired, they're growing weak, and he wants to kind of inspire them of how things, how they were before, passionate about their faith. He says, remember those earlier days after you received the light, the gospel of Jesus. Remember those days when you stood your ground in the great what? Contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. And you sympathized with those other believers in prison and you joyfully accepted the what? Confiscation of your property because you knew 
that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions awaiting you in heaven. So it was happening already, not that long after Jesus ascended. Their goods, their money were being taken from them. To learn to die to ourselves in the area of money and possessions so that we'll be ready when persecution comes, Jesus directs his followers to practice letting go of money and stuff by giving according to our means to those who ask and have a legitimate need. That's what I believe Jesus is getting at in Matthew 5.42. For if our soul, folks, is so anchored in our money and stuff, when persecution comes, we will not be able to handle having it taken away from us. Okay, so putting to death of the self by training ourselves to not retaliate when insulted, to not demand our rights every time our rights have been infringed upon, and learning how not to hold so tightly to what we possess by giving to those who are truly in need is what, from my humble perspective, is what Jesus is directing us to do in today's text so that we will be prepared when the time of testing comes. And don't think it will not come. Folks, Christians all over the world are suffering today. Suffering, just like they were in the first century. In this country, you do recognize and realize, right, that there are significant sections of our country who hate us simply because we are Christians, followers of Jesus. They hate us. And persecution in this country has already begun in more subtle ways, limiting our influence, trying to get God out of the schools, God out of the courtroom. God, this is all intentional, folks, setting up to marginalize Christians. So don't think it's not going to happen here. Okay, some of you know that I trained in martial arts for quite a few years. And this is a picture of me with my instructor. I'm Wolfman Jack over here. <laughs> so this is a picture of me with the instructor, uh, instructor at our dojo, and he's the attention, uh, you know, I, I want you to look at him because he's the point of this. So he trained me, this guy, all the way from white belt to black belt. And his name is Cecil Peoples. And if you Google martial arts Cecil Peoples, you're going to find all kinds of stuff come up about Cecil Peoples. Sensei Cecil went on to have an amazing lifelong career in martial arts. And in 2003, he was inducted into the Karate Hall of Fame. Back in the 70s, after I started fighting in tournaments, my sensei, my teacher, I remember him saying something that I have never forgotten. He said, Ed, you'll fight like you train. Let that settle in for a moment. You'll fight like you train. In other words, how you prepare or train for the battle will determine how well you're likely to do when the time comes for you to step into the ring and face your opponent. How well we're likely to do and hold up in the face of persecution will also be determined by how well we have trained and prepared for that time of testing. In the passage from the Sermon on the Mount that we've been studying today, my sense is that Jesus is giving us, his followers, things 
that we need to practice and train ourselves in so that we will be ready for the spiritual fight that being persecuted for our faith is. During the time of persecution, throughout the centuries, you study the history of Christianity, and you will see this again and again and again every time persecution comes. During the time of persecution, there are many who have quit the faith and denied Christ. Those are the ones who did not train hard. Determine now not to be one of those people. Train hard now. Well, that's my humble perspective on what Jesus is ultimately instructing us to do in this much debated part of his most famous sermon. I will not insist that you agree with every part of what I have shared with you this morning. But I really do think that what Jesus is getting at is something along these lines.